spoilers? Oh, lots and lots of spoilers. Time to hit the books. Hard. With a spatula. Until they learn the word RESPECT! Wait, wait, uh, no. It's time for another episode of Max Mike Movies. Good, I thought I tuned into the wrong show. You might have. Where we take a look at a movie and talk endlessly about points that matter to 507 totally different people. Really, I counted! (laughs) No, I did. Uh Uh, We're in the middle of a series called The Picks of Pixar, where we grab the best and the not-so-best movies made by that exalted studio and decide, once and for all, in a steel cage match! Oh, oh, sorry. (laughs) Wait, uh, uh, what are we deciding? I have no Uh, idea. I don't know. Yeah, um, but this week, we're tackling that college football player of a movie, the sequel prequel to Monsters, Inc., Monsters University. Ra, ra, ra. But wait. Good old P.U. But wait, who the heck are we? Mm. You'd think you'd know by now, this being episode 118, <laughs> but in case you don't, that cheerleader with the promiscuous pom-poms is Woo. miniskirt Max Levine. tee hee I can smell your hairy legs from here. (laughs) I am the Dean of Disaster, the professor of pork products beginning with the letter P, Mike Luce. But before we figure out what the hell is up with Zangief's ass, Mm. we have a little business to take care of. Business. Business. So, hey, past episodes, website, maxmikemovies.com. Hey, email us, us at maxmikemovies.com. Hey, uh, the social media, Twitter, Facebook. Spotify, if that's social media, I guess. I don't know. Not uh, really. Max Mike Movies. Um, and don't forget to give us a little rating because it makes us really happy and smile, and yeah. otherwise we'll die. Uh, <laughs> smash that like button. Smash. <laughs> smash! Hulk I smash! Don't, I don't go know. To sleep. People keep saying that at me, and I, it frightens me. <laughs> and don't forget to subscribe because oh, you yeah, get that, lots of bonuses. Yeah, is it smash the subscribe button? Or I, don't is it, know. I don't know. Uh, the likey thing, subscribey, hoodle, doidle. Young uh, people hoodle. frighten me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the thing, because we do yeah, this show. We do. And, yeah. Right, that was our business. Hey, Monsters University, it's trivia yeah. time. Trivia. The show. Trivia, um, trivia, two points. Trivia, trivia, two points. Keep that up. I'm trying Buzz to do, get in the college spirit. <laughs> oola, uh, you're boola, not doing the dance. Boola, boola. <laughs> Yeah, uh, everyone's going to know what that's yeah, from. Nobody uh, under the age of 70 is going to know, know what that means. What is it, the Yale fight song, I think? I think so. It had something yeah. to do with Yale. I don't know. I, yeah. So, budget, because we love to do the budget part. 200 million kabukis. Yikes. How much is that in American money? Nothing. Kabukis are pancakes. <laughs> deep that's cut a, for you Mad Magazine fans. Oh, that's a deeper, eh? Oh, yeah. Uh, take... 743 millimats. So pretty good, no? <laughs> not, ba- um, not bad. I'm not sure what the millimat to kabuki uh, tra- conversion rate is, but that's pretty good. I'll check later. Interestingly, because of, of the added costs dollars. of marketing, etc., the actual profit was only gauged at 179 million Cronkites. <laughs> oh, yeah. poor da, da, Pixar. Da, 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 da. Uh, <laughs> this movie would come in at number seven overall for the year, being 2013, uh, being beaten out by other animated movies, such as Frozen, which came in at number six. Ah, that was a fad. It's and gone. interestingly, Despicable Me, which came in at number <laughs> two for the year. Huh. What's number one, you may ask? Iron Man 3. That's not an animated movie. No, just a well, movie overall. But part the of fact it is. that Despicable Me beat out Frozen, I thought was like, really? Yeah. Was, that's surprising. Yeah, I mean, it was fun. Um, yeah. I mean, to be fair, it was more fun than Frozen, but that's uh, for another here we show. Go. <clears throat> Uh, when students touch the foot of the statue outside the scare building, it's a nod to folks who touch the left foot of the statue of the supposed John Harvard, which stands inside Harvard Yard, the Statue of Three Lies. Hey. That is not John Harvard. That's, that's not John Harvard. That's number one. That's not John Harvard. That's lie number one. Lie number two, it's the wrong date. That's not when Harvard was, in fact, uh, started. And lie number three, he didn't start it. Nope. All he did was give them a bunch of books. Yeah. So there, you learned something. I hope it didn't hurt. Slight problem with continuity. In Monsters, Inc., there's a reference to Mike and Sully having met as far back as the fourth grade. 
There was a sequence to show these, this that was boarded and scripted, but it was decided that it only complicated the narrative and it was left out. They figured no one would notice and probably almost no one did. I didn't. Yeah, me neither. Uh, Helen Mirren, I'm sorry, Helen Mirren, <laughs> Dame <laughs> Helen Mirren. Dame here, Helen Mirren, thank you very much. She was just offered the role of Dean Hardscrabble, but insisted on auditioning because she wanted oh. to make sure Pixar would be happy with her performance. That's why. She, that's if. why we love her. We love you, Dame <laughs> Helen. I. She's what one of those pro. actors that. I, I, yeah, I don't know anything I've seen her in that I didn't like her. So no. Nope. And, and this is probably like one of her lesser performances, and she still knocks it out of the park. What little there is of it. Mm. I don't agree with the character, but we'll get into that. Yeah. Easter eggs, the damned uh, pizza truck, dinosaurs uh, from what was supposed to be the next Pixar movie, The Good Dinosaur. It wasn't. It was delayed uh, and fast. Uh, they fast forwarded Inside Out. Uh, John Ratzenberger reprising his Yeti rule, role, uh, Room A with thir- one thirteen, ad infinitum, and so forth, etc. Yes, and Easter no doubt two hundred others that it's physically impossible for us to see unless you stop and go frame by frame through the movie. And I keep promising that we're going to talk about Easter eggs, but this time I mean it. <laughs> The scaring hall building is supposed to evoke the image of Cthulhu. I did notice that this time. It does kind of look like him. Well, if you squint real hard. So the dome is supposed to be its head. The columns are supposed to represent the mouth tentacles. I don't Mm. know the proper word for that. Uh, The um, Zoidberger things. (laughs) Um, I don't see it myself, but it is a hell of a design reference for a Pixar movie. (laughs) Cthulhu, catch it! (laughs) Sure, let's talk it. Welcome to Monsters University, where your sanity will shatter like fine china. Yeah. Um, hey, the Wilhelm scream, because uh, Hollywood still hasn't read our memo. For those uh, of you, again, who have, don't know what the Wilhelm scream is, don't look it up. Just trust us. You should always trust us. Needs to go away. Hey, did you notice? Notice we have a new Murray in this film. A new Murray? A new oh, Murray. Dawn what? is voiced not by Brian Doyle Murray, oh, right. Murray but younger Murray, Joel Murray. Joel Welcome Murray. to the fold, Joel Murray. Out of way. Nice to see him following the family tradition. Sure, because uh. if you're if Joe Estevez is out of town, <laughs> you can always get Joel Murray. I, I actually know nothing about him, but I actually when I heard the voices, like, is that Brian Doyle? It's not really gruff enough. And it's like, nope, it's so Joel. he is he is related, he's one of the Murrays. He is the youngest, or the youngest. I, he's a younger brother. So ah, Murray the younger, okay. A, a lesser Murray. <laughs> oh, I <need> Murray. Murray. <laughs> Uh, this is interestingly the last Pixmar movie. Pixmar. 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 <laughs> we should open up a company. Pixmar. Uh. Last Pixar movie to date that is rated G. Those huh. dirty birds at Pixar. Dirty bird. Dirty bird. <laughs> dirty, dirty, dirty. They never got out of the cockadoody car. Um, <laughs> yeah. The librarian's voice actor, Marshall Wallace, who is better known as Carol from the Bob Newhart show and Mrs. Krabappel from The Simpsons, would pass away soon after this movie, so this would sadly be her last film performance. You might know her from the shh. That was Yeah, her. that's her whole line. Kinda. Yeah. Uh, Disney wanted a sequel to Monsters, Inc. as early as 2005, but then-owner of Pixar, Steve Jobs, didn't see eye-to-eye with then-Disney head Michael Eisner. The original plot had Sully and Mike going to the human world to find Boo and give her a birthday present. Boo's family had moved. Mike and Sully then have a fight over how to proceed, which was the conflict of the movie. The idea would finally be rejected after Pixar sailed to Disney in 2006. Uh, we got, actually we got sounds this. like kind of interesting, but okay. Maybe. Um, yeah. Pixar actually made a website for Monsters University, going so far as to fake a hack of the site by rival school Fear Tech. Oh, dear. There were, there were admissions links and information about cancer, campus life, etc. Huh. Okay, that's so, cute. Yeah, it actually kind of was. Uh, strangely, a lot of the trivia had to do with the fact that lots of the voice actors only do non G rated films, as if this is somehow interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I thought I'd include that. Lots and lots. It's like, you know, this guy only does PG, like, whatever. Mm. Okay. Uh, I actually wasn't going to include this, but strangely, this is the third film that has John Goodman and Billy Crystal in it. The third? Well, I guess what the second one was, because it was Monsters Inc. Yeah. Do you know what the third one was? Uh, Cars 3. There in that? Oh. Apparently that's what it said. Well, I, I never saw that one, so huh, I'll, I'll take um, their word for it. As far as I could tell, it was not nominated for any Oscars. Monsters University? Yep. 
Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think, except for the Toy Story movies, I don't think any of the Pixar sequels were. Yeah, and uh, there might be a reason for that. <clears throat> Do you have any other uh, trivia that you know of of this film? Only that there's a bridge in the at Monsters U where they do the sort of underwater student gag that looks an awful lot like the Harvard Bridge. Yeah, you mean the Mass Ave Bridge, that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be because they did visit Harvard. That was one of the places they visited. Most of it's based on uh, um, I forget which school, but also Pixar's campus itself is. Uh, oh, okay. You know, because they have a big monument to Cthulhu there. <clears throat> Sure. Uh, so before I get to the plot, uh, now we have a word from our sponsor, Blue Apron. No, no, no. What? Of course our sponsor is Rogue Warfare 3. Roar, Rogue Warfare 3, catch it! <laughs> I think I caught it, but I think I'm over it now. No, they, they make a cream for it. Ooh, an ointment. Tincture. A, a tincture, possibly an unguent. Unguent. That's our word for the day. That's our unguent. word for the day, kids. <laughs> unguent. <laughs> All right. Plot. <laughs> Mike and Sully, those lovable monsters from Pixar's Monsters, Inc., are back. Or they're here before they were... Well, you know what I mean. Where did Time they come from? wobbly timey-wimey. Yep. <laughs> How did they meet and become friends? Well, sit back, friends, and find out. Mike Wazowski, nerdy, last chosen kid in grade school, takes a field trip to Monsters, Inc. and sees those energy-producing scarers in action. Star-eyed, he decides right then and there that that's what he wants to be when he grows up. Fast forward, and we're at Monsters University, where the best scarers learn their trade, TM. Mike, still nerdy, has studied every last fact about scaring and is ready to put it to use. But when he comes up against a loud, overconfident Sully who is trying to skate by on a family name and raw talent, he finds his work cut out for him. After an argument and accident-causing fight during an exam, the duo find themselves kicked out of the scaring program by Dean Hardscrabble. Boo. But there's an all-school scaring contest coming up, and Mike uses this to place a bet with the Dean, whereby if he and his team, made up of the outcast fraternity, Uzma Kappa, win the competition, he and the entire team will be put back in the program. If he loses, he and Sully will leave campus forever, expelled in shame. Shame. From there, we see interfrat house rivalries, pranks, and the super high stakes contest between top school scaring teams. Will Mike and Sully make it? Will Team Uzma Kappa win the coveted trophy? Will Scarecrow ever get his bread? Oh, <laughs> no, he won't, actually. Ah, uh, uh, but that would be telling the end. The lowdown. Right. That was a short episode. Okay. <laughs> it, it was? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I well, missed you, all that you, much, really. No, no, you left it. No, no, I mean, the whole time you said the end. I assume we're done. Okay, next oh. week, folks, we'll be talking about... Oh. <laughs> That's all you need to know yep. from us about Monsters University. Yep. Hey, mm. my first note. The sequel, we didn't know we didn't want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this, this, is the, this wasn't the first, but it's another in a line of, really, sequels from Pixar. Yeah. Well, I to, yeah, I'll start off with a question. Uh, so, did you like Monsters, Inc.? I did. I liked it a lot. I don't think it's one of their greatest, because it doesn't make me cry. Okay. That no, To me, that's the judge of the best Pixar movies make you cry. Because, God damn it, Max likes to cry. I do. Oh, you're going to cry, all right. Uh, but, uh, that's right, because I'm a man, darn it. <laughs> Excuse me, you're going to go outside and uproot a tree. <laughs> a uh, man with hairy legs and a miniskirt uh, and pom-poms. <laughs> And pumps. Don't forget my hurt me pumps. Uh, <laughs> They're but, darling and lovely. <laughs> oh, thank uh, you. Um, wow, we got way off track. Um, <laughs> so you liked Monsters? I Inc. liked Monsters Inc. It's funny. I love the voice acting in Monsters Inc. I, I thought the pairing of Billy Crystal and John Goodman is is amazing. I they also want to give so them credit fun. for for casting James Coburn in a kids film. Yeah, wow! How do you get away with that? I mean, apart from seeing him on the Muppet Show, and even then, they make a big thing out of how how violent most of his movies are, which yeah. is why he gets along with animals so well. Is <laughs> yeah, that that was surprising, and you know, Steve Buscemi. <laughs> Yeah, let, let, you, know, you know who we need in a kids movie? Steve Buscemi <laughs> and James Coburn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and mean, they it's, it's, and it works. It works beautifully. I mean, I love Randall. He's a great villain. Yeah, and, and uh, again, that that was the other neat thing. It's one of those rare movies uh, where the villain doesn't genuinely doesn't think he's a villain. He really thinks he's doing the right thing. 
Right. Although again, it's for profit, but and visually it was great. The the monster designs were a lot of fun. Yep. Although I always had a little bit of a problem with okay, none of you are scary. I know it's a kids movie. I know they can't make them too scary or they won't be sympathetic. Right. But they all look, you know, like toys. Collectible. Yes, they all look collectible. <laughs> exactly what they look like and I'm sure that's what they were were. Yeah. But yes, Except for, I like for the Boo. first one. No, Boo is Boo. adorable. Well, she's as adorable as they could get at that point. Yeah, she's a little uncanny valley, but uh, yeah. She was definitely a step up from the original Toy Story. Yes. Um, and quite yes. honestly, in her little suit, her little monster suit, she really <laughs> is really cute. She is. Um, yeah, so yes, I like the first movie a lot. Yeah, it, it was kind of out of nowhere. It was a concept. It was like, what are you... Okay, we're two main characters work at a power company. That sounds exciting. And it yes. was fun. Well, the um, initial part... The initial, when I had heard the pitch, it's like, what if it means the monster in your closet is real? It's like, oh, right. that's interesting. Sure. And they're public utility workers. Oh, what? Huh? <laughs> it's like, Con okay. Edison comes to kindergarten, I guess. <laughs> and yet again, that was a great thing about Pixar. It's like, wow, that is really original. That is, yeah. I did not ever think of to go there. Yeah. And it wasn't a particularly challenging film. It was fairly straightforward. Yeah. Um, the, the voice acting, I mean, Billy Crystal... He's an actor who's got that kind of voice. He has a very animated voice. Yep. And, of course, John Goodman would strangely go on to play the live-action version of a very well-known animated character in yabba Fred Flintstone. Yabba-dabba-do! <laughs> yabba-dabba-don't. Yeah, really, um, yabba-dabba-don't. Just don't. So there is a cartoonishness about John Goodman. Um, so I can see that. I never would have thought of Steve Buscemi or James Coburn, yeah. but whatever. Uh, I guess they are kind of monstrous in a way, right? Because... Mm. You know, whatever. Uh, it did work. And I honestly have no problem seeing Billy Crystal do kind of just about anything, right? Um, I love, he's my favorite um, Oscars host next to Johnny Carson. Yep. Um, he's, I liked him in, uh, what was that, the cowboy film? Um, oh, uh, City Slickers. That's it. I, I liked him in City Slickers. He's terrific. Uh, I, yeah, no he's, question. He's John Goodman is also not only really talented, but has real range. He yeah. can do comedy, he can do drama, he can do the sort of paternal character, he can do the kind of terrifying character. You know the first film I saw him in, I know I actually be his first quote-unquote big role. But was in a Talking Heads film called True oh, Stories. Oh, right, he was in that. I think that, if not, if that wasn't his first, it was, must have been one of them. He even sings in that. That's Yeah, he, he can sing. Yeah. Which well unfortunately enough. they try to make use of in Blues Brothers 2000. Oh yeah, I forgot they did that. Good. Ah, moving on. Uh, so yeah, anyway. we we had a we had a nice movie, and it had a good story, and it, and had, it wrapped be, up be, nicely. It did. So now we have this. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we the, we have the opening where we show little Mike going to uh, the his first field trip to Monsters Inc. And, and it's nice. Yeah, and they it's but they not really ladle on the here's how pathetic and lonely he is. Yeah, because that was necessary. Apparently, I get I you know, and oh, he's got braces because that equals. I got to tell you, that was sort of a, a, a to me a misstep um, because braces when you and I were growing up were like that was that was a social stigma. Yeah. Now adults get them. Yeah, because movie like, stars get them. Yeah, and it's like it's it's almost considered like I wouldn't say cool, but it's not uncool to have braces. So showing Mike the only monster with braces, and the sad thing is, is he doesn't need them. Um, it's like okay, and then he has a retainer, a retainer, retainer. <laughs> Sorry, that's deep roll. That's a deep ray. Um, it, it's like okay, I guess that's a way to make him nerdy. Um, I didn't find it necessary, but whatever. So he gets to college, he has a retainer, yeah. and he still doesn't have any friends, although he thinks he does, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't understand that bus because it's like it says Monsters University. The only person getting off the bus is Mike Wazowski. Yeah, and he apparently has already gotten to know everybody on the bus. Yeah, were they were high school? I don't. I know. have no idea. No idea. But that whole thing. Yeah, that 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 part of Mike is kind of interesting. He has this enormous amount of absolutely unearned confidence. Mm -hmm. And. And we'll get to that. He is so convinced he can be a scarer, that he can be scary because it's his dream and he's worked very hard. And that actually comes up with a really interesting message in this movie. But 
Uh, yeah, we want to get to that because I have notes about that too. Yeah, um, yeah, we'll get there later. The the university itself, I like the way it looks, except other than the students, it looks like an absolutely ordinary university. Right. Which doesn't make sense. I, I had well, a, that was a little problem I had with uh, the original Monsters Inc. You know, Monstropolis looked like any other city, which was designed to accommodate ordinary humanoid bipeds, which a whole lot of these monsters aren't. No. I mean, they even do one as a sight gag who has got to be like 70 feet tall. Right. How and does, Frisbee, yeah. How does that, where does that monster sleep? Where's the dorms yeah. for the giant monsters? Where are the dorms for the flying ones? And interestingly, they would tackle this in Zootopia. They yeah. have like like the little tiny mouse characters have their own little subway, and the giraffes have their own like counter at the Orange Julius stand and stuff like that. Yeah, I, that I, is it, much more a city that you can tell was designed for multiple life forms, multiple sizes and, and types. Try and catch me, Flatfoot. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, um, I, I it still doesn't make any sense. Like you can't think too far into it because it's like, yeah. well, you know, urban development. We're gonna have to take out Mouse City. Well, it's only about twenty foot square, so it's you know we'll just <laughs> yeah, put yeah. them on that, top of that's the building. A whole, that's a whole other movie. But this is like, well, all the doorways are human shaped. Yeah, the steps are designed for feet. Yeah, nothing looks like it's designed for monsters. No, and it's like the. I mean, the one thing they make a nod to is like, oh. Uh, here's a cute gag. So the the food is really good here, and you see them in the cafeteria, and people are dumping out their trays. And then one of the cafeteria workers just takes the garbage can and dumps it back into the trough, and the kids love it. So it's like, okay, yeah. they eat terrible food, except that we know they don't because in the first Monsters Inc. film, they go to Harrahausen's, which is this really upscale restaurant. Yeah, and we still but, they eat pizza and everything. It's not like they eat strange foods, but right. apparently some of them do. And there's the some of the the sight gags are a bit much like the the slug character or the snail character yeah i mean when he shows up and he's like oh i better get to class i don't want to be late and he's miming with his arms that he's running and he's actually moving like an inch every minute and i just look at i look <laughs> oh. at this and go this is going to be a recurring gag well, now, admittedly it only shows up again once in the post credits but i didn't wait that long it, i yeah. mean really i mean yeah, yeah i know <laughs> uh, where's my script <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um and we so we start off with Mike, he gets there first. Yeah. And so we see the the college through his eyes. And to be fair, I don't know what a lot of college cam- college campuses look like outside the Northeast, but it really felt like any Northeast campus. And I yeah. say Northeast because we have seasons and it's got all the brick buildings and stuff. I don't know if like California campuses are the same or Arizona, I'm betting they're not. Um and this is one of the problems I have with the film. We'll get to that too. But it's just bland college campus there's nothing particularly interesting about okay the scare building supposedly looks like cthulhu i didn't notice it it looks like a dome yeah, all the other see. buildings just look like ordinary buildings yeah. i did like some of the opening gags when he's when mike is walking through campus and the, all the clubs are trying to recruit yeah and the thing is but again the thing is all the clubs are the same kind of clubs you would have at a human college yeah you know there's the poetry club there's i did like the improv club you know the guy's like yeah join us and life can be like uh oh i like <laughs> it is, he, he, can't, he can't improv that was, okay we right. get it that's good but it's nothing yeah. like where where is the like i don't know explore the sewers or uh, well because <laughs> i did that once um yeah. the steam tunnels to be yeah, fair why but. aren't there why isn't there anything uh monster specific or or paranatural or something yeah yeah, I, well, I, I, so, get, I get that sort of the idea is the whole world of Monst- of Monsters, Inc. and Monsters University is it's supposed to be pretty much an analog for the human world. It just happens to be populated by monsters. Highly collectible which, monsters. Highly collectible monsters, which, again, you can't think about it too hard. Some no. of the character design, I really like Dean Hardscrabble. I she did, is creepy she as also, hell. She is, but she also felt oddly specific. So a lot of the other man- monsters, most of the other monsters, are in general pretty brightly colored, and they're not, like, their details are not so tightly rendered. And she felt, like, her coloring was was much more subdued, 
And she had, like, centipede legs and big bat wings, but her face, too, was a lot more specific than a lot of the other characters. Even Mike Wazowski, although he's the only one-eyed little green ball guy, all he's got is one green eye, which they articulate exceedingly well, and no nose and just a mouth. Like, he's just a green ball with arms and legs and one eye. There's nothing particularly specific about the details in his face. Heart Scrabble is. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad design. I just thought it was odd that she kind of stands out. Um, mo and more than just being really scary, which she is. Um, I mean, it's also Helen Mirren. And Helen Mirren, just <laughs> did, her voice is enough to terrify. Although, I, I have to admit... When she's like talking about how I am not here to turn mediocre students into less mediocre students, I'm going, you're channeling John Hausman from The Paper Chase. I kept expecting her to say, hey, you know, if you have time to listen to rock and roll music, you have time to scare. <laughs> or look at the person to your left and the person to your right. One of you will not be here at the end of the semester. Like, wow, okay, yeah. Yeah, well, we're going to get to her that, too, because that's another point. Uh, although I will say, if anybody really has uh, the ability to channel John Hausman, it's Helen Mirren. Yeah. She, she yeah. can do that. But I had a question before we get too far away from the, the, the campus in general is Max. Yeah. Did you have any experiences like those that are depicted when you were in college? Uh, well, some. My college was very small. So we didn't have... Well, first off, there were no fraternities. Although I do, okay. I do remember going to Yale for to look. I, I didn't go to Yale, but I, I was there for a visit and an interview, and they're showing us the secret societies. You know, skull and bones. Oh no, I mean that's that's yeah, not skull a thing. and that's bones not real. and no, uh, no, the real. wolf clan or whatever they were called. Oh, the furries, huh? Yeah. I don't know what they. I don't remember. It's something <laughs> to do with wolf. They come. They apparently come out and howl at the moon every so okay. often. And, Great. And yeah, there was frater and at the uh, when I was in the Midwest, there was fraternity row. Okay, uh, boy, you didn't want to hang around there on the weekends. If you want, you was cared. that grad school? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was there at the University of Minnesota. Yeah, mm, but uh, not specific. Not exactly the same. Co my college was, like I say, a very small liberal arts college. It also wasn't a university, so grad school okay. and grad school was different because you just you weren't as connected with the rest of it. You lived in your little enclave. Because it just seemed to me, because my college experiences are... Um, 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 Partial. Well, I'll put it out there. Well, <laughs> thank you, Mac. Well. I appreciate the support. <laughs> uh, yes, it's true. I did not graduate college either time. Um, so my, my experience... And I didn't live there, which I think makes a big difference. Yeah. Uh, I, I was a day student. Mm. But this felt to me... Like it was based not on anything current, but every college caper movie of the yes. 50s. Yes. Oh, no. That's not just the 50s. This is, that was one of my, my issues with this movie. This is one of the few, the cars, the original cars being the first one, where you go, I've seen this. This is, it's not just the 50s. I'm going, oh, here we go. Here it's, there's the snooty house. Yeah, this is Animal House. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, oh, it's Revenge of the Nerds because we've got the yep. nerdy little fraternity that you know the underdogs. No, this is yeah. not just from the fifties. This goes all the way up to probably the eighties. This is every co goofy college comedy ever. Yeah, I'm surprised. I will say that. Yeah, I was gonna say I will say that besides being exceedingly funny, Animal House at least gets away with it because they said it in the 60s, in the mm. early 60s. So it's like, oh, it's not like this now, but <laughs> if it was, I think it would go something, something like, this. like this. I gotta say, uh, even the song, the music that they're playing when he enters the uh, the campus, it sounds an awful lot like Faber College's uh, yeah. song from Animal House. I, well, I think there's a green nod sleeves. there. Hmm? It's based on green sleeves, just like well. It's of. also a lot of it. I, you, you can hear the fair Harvard in the background at one point, yeah. and uh, that uh, there's some song that like nine different universities use the same melody. Oh, da 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 da, da <laughs> which I only remember, of course, from Cornell. My father. There's an awful yeah, there's smell a, high above Cayuga's <laughs> waters. There's an awful smell. Maybe it's Cayuga's waters. Maybe, Maybe it's Cornell. It's Cornell. Yeah. <laughs> Not the uh, official word. I hate to say that because my mother went. There. Yeah, yeah. My <laughs> but there you go. Um, I, it's just it feels so generic 
And so, and of course, the one thing that's missing, which is fine because it's a Pixar film, is there's no sex. Um, And there's no love story, which I applaud them because we don't need one. No, it's not necessary. There's no romance in this. No, it's a buddy film. Um, But it feels just so, like, you know, like you said, seen it before, but also just so out of date. Like, it doesn't feel like, I don't think college is like this. I mean, I'm sure, yeah, okay, there's frats, there's frat parties, and so on and so forth. But everything else just felt so, uh, eh. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know about just, these days, but of course, the other where were all the political activist groups? And, right. And where were the um, protests? I mean, the closest we came is one of the, I guess it's a sorority, to be fair. One of the sororities had punks in it. Which Oh, I thought they were goths. It, okay. Or well, goth punks, whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to tell. It is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, they weren't reb- rebelling, or rebelling, rebelling against anything. They just were, you know, I guess, grr. Not, they were trying to be nonconformist, except they all dressed the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the college thing, I didn't I didn't have any experiences like this either. But again, you know, being a day student, I think it does matter. You, you don't uh, have to. What the, the, the experiences, and this isn't like about college experience this is a college movie experience right and to be fair again the colleges i went to i went to emerson which has been called that sort of college in boston although they have actually turned around a lot since i went there hey they're really well known for as being a theater school yes and they actually have two theaters in boston now which are both of which are quite amazing yeah um the the film program was was not being paid attention to when i was Ah. there in the 80s uh, and the other college well, I went to, which was you got to remember when we went to college, though, know, film we hadn't gotten to color yet or sound. <laughs> hey, Dorothy, pack it in. <laughs> um, and then when I went to Mass College of Art, which I also did not graduate from, there was no fraternities or anything like that there either. Um, but to me, it just felt again very, very fifties. Anyway, so we walk through, we see the very um, plain and and stereotypical college campus and we finally get to the scare classroom and we meet sully and in a way just like mike wazowski we have sully in a way that we don't know him and don't like him so apparently the theme of this movie is to take characters that we like and make them unlikable Eh, i guess the idea is to see how they change because both of them do they do both have a story arc it's a little shallow and it's also because yeah. one of the nice things about Monsters Inc. was their relationship. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were such it's good a friends. Film. It's a, a buddy, yeah. buddy movie then, and this was like, oh, here's how the friendship is built. It's just, it's such a, another cliche of, oh, look, they really hate each other. They're polar opposites to begin with, and then they discover there's more than unites them than divides them. Yeah, in a very quick and out of nowhere uh, scene yeah um this is this is what did i have it as the uh the i've been a real jerk scene mm. seems to come out of nowhere yeah yeah like it's almost like oh crap it's quarter past uh i've been a real jerk <laughs> okay yeah um yeah uh, but okay and again though it's like when we meet sully like if you haven't seen monsters inc and it's actually okay if you have yeah i think that's true if you true. saw this first which is actually good right so it's a story that can stand on its own because it's two characters going through this quite honestly i don't want sully to win i <laughs> don't like him <laughs> yeah. i actually kind of like randall who is just kind of nerdy but he's like he's trying to be liked he's trying to be nice and there is a moment where he gets accepted and wazowski doesn't and he he's like hey don't ruin this for me which i understand that's understandable poor guy this is is his one shot at being accepted and he doesn't do anything mean to mike wazowski well he just is like he does that he only later thing he, he does later he does he's in on the uh the humiliation that they suffer at the frat party yeah let's get to that in a sec because yeah. that's a dumb scene yes um there's but then later what happens is in in the big contest um he's up against sully and sully like totally thrashes his score and uh randall makes a mistake of he's a he's a chameleon like character so he often takes on the appearance of whatever he's in front of unfortunately trying to scare a kid he uh is i forget if it's a rug or whatever it yeah, is that has hearts rug. on it mm-hmm. so he tries to scare the kid and he's covered with hearts it doesn't really work and all that happens like the only thing that's done to randall is that he happens to be up against sully and sully beats him and gives him his little wink and his little finger gun shooting 
thing. That's it. And then suddenly Randall's like, I hate him forever. Yeah. It's like, okay. Well, he says, that's the last time I'll lose to you, Sullivan. Yeah, but it's like his character totally changes for not really any reason except that we know what he's like in the previous or the next. F- how, I don't know how yeah, it works. Yeah. Uh, and it's just sort of like we have to get these characters to where we know they were. Are go- and it's yeah, that felt very forced. And, yeah. And the thing is, the you know Mike and Sully who are both trying to fit in, and Sully for a while is part of the super. Uh, Oh, what the hell? The jocks. The jocks. Let's face it. Yeah, they the were jocks. the jocks. The scarers at this school are the jocks, and uh, <clears throat> they're the uh, alpha beta out of Revenge of the Nerds. They're the 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 rich entitled uh, fraternity. Was it Roar Omega Roar? Yeah. And Sully gets thrown out of that. And they end up, of course, with the uh, Delta House or. Try Lamb yeah. from Revenge of the Nerds. They end up in the pathetic fraternity with, with every cliche possible character. You've got the little nerdy guy who's the mama's boy. You've got the artsy one. You have the slightly crazy one. You have the uh, middle-aged guy going back to school. Yeah, played by the lesser Murray yes, brother. The le- um. Yes. And that was the other th- the thing that kind of bothers me is... For example, uh, Terry and Terry, the two-headed monster. I'm Terry with a Y. I'm Terry with an I. Yeah. You know who those were? That was Dave Foley and Sean Hayes. These, Barely. These are two very funny comic actors, and they get, they get almost nothing to do. Yeah. It's a real well, waste. In general, I, for me, pretty much every joke fell flat. Like, oh, it's a joke. Yeah. Like, it, that's what it felt like. Except and for Mike, and uh, Mike is still funny. I still think the character, you know, Mike Wazowski and, and sometimes Sully are, are funny. But that's I, about I wouldn't, it. I wouldn't give them laugh out loud no. funny, but they're enjoyable. Yeah. Like you, the voices are good, and you like them as characters mostly. Again, Sully's kind of a jerk through the whole thing. Yeah. He makes a swift change for no particular well, reason. He, he plays a traditional sort of dude bro. You know, yeah. he, he's the popular just, jock who's never had to try. He coasts yeah. on his family name, and like you said, raw talent. He's obviously a natural scarer, but because of that, he's like... Uh, he's like the jock from a high school who was the biggest and the strongest and suddenly gets to college, and that's not enough. Right. And also, that's not going to be enough once you're out of college. Yeah. Um, it's like he's one of the guys who could have peaked in high school, and then, then we don't ever hear. They sell cars now, but uh, not good cars. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the whole premise just feels like it's from a well-worn 60s sitcom. There's just every, like, one of those jokes you might have seen on Bewitched, which probably wasn't new then, isn't new now. And all of the situations, and as you pointed out, the stereotypical characters just aren't helping. Revenge of the Nerds, the fact that this has anything to do with Revenge of the Nerds, (laughs) one, two, or three, is just, you know, okay, that's what a great thing to take things from. Um, I mean, I I can't believe I'm being chased by Guido the Killer Pimp. Uh, I know that's not from the internet. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's from I risk, think it's from uh, risky, risky business. business. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then, like, even weirder are the like morals or lesson of the film. Max, what to you? What is the moral or the lesson of this film? This actually surprised me. That was one of the things about this movie that uh, I was actually kind of impressed with. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. The, Tell me. To me, one of the messages of the film is Mike, who has convinced himself that he can be a scarer based purely on the fact that he really wants to be and studies it and discovers it's not enough. It's not enough. And the fact is, in real life, that is true. Sometimes you can have a dream and you can want it with all your heart and work like hell, but you ha- but you can't do it. It's like... <laughs> Because he's not scary. He's not a frightening monster, and nothing he can do can change that. It's like if I suddenly decided that I wanted to be a a decathlon athlete, and I worked like hell at it, and I wanted nothing more, I still would die during the tryouts. (laughs) Because Not if you ate your Wheaties. (laughs) And let's face it, Chris, then even, you might turn into a woman later. Even <laughs> if I started when I was a kid, I know what my physical limitations are. I'm not built to be that kind of athlete. I never would have been. And no matter how much I want it, it would never have happened. It's like if you now, 
it's funny. I was looking this up. This I, I thought this was a great example, except there are a couple of exceptions to it. If Let's say you want to be a basketball player. You want to be a professional basketball player. And you want it since you were five years old and you practiced every day and you went after it. But it, but you're five foot two. You're not going to be a prof- in the in the WNBA or the W or the NBA. You're just not. Except uh, then I looked up. It's like, oh yeah, that there's that basketball player Muggsy B. He was he was a legendary NBA player, and he was five foot three. So if, but, if, I, if, if I understand this correctly, what you're trying to say is that the moral of this film for little kids is there's just some things you can't do. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> pretty much. The moral for little kids. That's awesome. Hey, kids, <laughs> just give up now. Well, you know, I, I always liked on The Simpsons you know, when uh, you know, Bart is saying, I, I don't get it. You know, I tried really hard, and I'm just never going to be as good as these guys. And and he's and his Homer's going. Well, that's the truth. Okay, there's always someone better or stronger or faster. That's what the why the lesson learned here is never try. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad that Pixar was able yeah. to articulate now, that message and just send it home to little kids because well, it's really over, what I've done is really oversimplified. But it's the idea that you're, and yet <laughs> you what you want. I mean, it's the idea that your expectations have to be tempered with reality. Just wanting something doesn't make it happen. Well, no, but that's not the point. The point isn't just he doesn't just want it, he works at it. And the point, I think, is, or could be taken but is not in any way expressed by this film, is that even if you don't make it, there's something valuable in the effort yes, of having tried. there's something valuable, and you also but, can maybe, your dream doesn't have to be exactly the same, because he does become a valuable uh, in effect, person who collects fear energy in that he's the right. coach. He helps Sully. He's the one, as Sully says, uh, I could never have figured any of this out without you. Yeah. Every, every, he's basically, he's the brains as opposed to the brawn. But there's just such, such weird mixed message things like to me telling little kids there's things you can't do kids so get over give up yeah Um, there's there's that there's a scene at the near the end where he's been expelled for reasons i don't understand because he and sully have just created more scare energy than anybody ever and the first thing dean hardscrabble does is expel them and then when they're leaving she says the person who expelled them mind you there's nothing I can do for you. Wait, wait! You're there's the tons team, you not can to do mention for the, them. Not to mention the fact that the reason initially that they were going to be expelled is on a bet. Right. There was no. The dean. They had not failed any courses. They no. had not committed ac- any academic uh, inf- in, uh, infractions. No. I, I mean, okay. Tw- at the end, Sully does cheat in a yes, game. He does. Which has right. absolutely no meaning, right? I mean, it, well, it's because it's it's important to her because she set that whole thing up. Yeah, right. Yeah, she was the initiator of the whole scare. But games that whole thing. thing back for, when she was I don't there. know any dean who has that the kind of power she throws around. Well, when she says arrest them, I'm like, I don't think you can do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you may have campus police, but I don't think, yeah. But so, yeah, so Mike's leaving. He's getting on the bus, I guess the same one that he showed up on. And she says to him, uh, there's nothing I could do, but I'll keep my eye on you because you've done something nobody else has done behind, besides the whole scare thing. She says, you've surprised me. But then, oh, our hands are tied. Why? Yeah. Why? We don't know. All so of this Mike, is because of her. Yeah. Yeah. So Mike has a little discussion with Sully, who's like, oh, dude, we should totally do stuff. And he turns to him with this very somber expression and the light just behind him. And he says, no, I shall get on the bus, diminish and remain in Mike Wazowski. (laughs) He does not say that. (laughs) He pretty much does, because that's supposed to be the cry moment, right? That's our that's our moment. I'm guessing. And he gets on the bus and he's like, I realize I'm not great. I'm just okay, and I'm fine with that. Which is quite honestly, that is a really like you're what what you're you're fine with being media. No, our ca- <laughs> that is kind of like I was kind of heart wrenching in a way because it's like, what are you teaching me? <laughs> I don't want to be mediocre, and my name's Mike. Stop it. <laughs> um, but then of course Sully's like, no, we can take our mediocrity and run with it. So then 
they answer the ad that has been showing up in the film, like, hey, you could work at the mailroom at Monsters, Inc., the first film, and they do it, and they work their way up to the same position that Randall gets when he graduates school. So you see, the message and- here is, kids, don't waste time with school. I know. <laughs> it's just like, what the hell? Yeah, that was a little odd, although interesting. I mean, again... That, that's kind. It's kind of an elitist attitude to say, "Oh no, you can only succeed if you go to college." No, if you, it's harder. But uh, they, they no. actually, there's nothing wrong with working your way up. It takes longer. No, but but uh, to the other problem. Well, it doesn't take longer. That's the thing because uh, they're like when we see the second film, the first film, however yeah. this works. Uh, it's obvious that Randall and uh, Sully and Mike are all on the same level. So I'm guessing that. Randall learned what he did in school, got his job, and when he got there, those guys were already scarers, which now that I would understand why he'd be pissed at them. That would piss him off. But they don't, it's like they don't focus on the things that I actually think would be important, like you just said, that, hey, there's not just one way to do something. Maybe you have to take a different way, and maybe it's going to be harder because you have to figure out your your path. It's not laid out yeah. for you like a, a class of course, a course of classes, but whatever. But they don't do that. Um, we also get the weird message because because Sully cheated and uh, Uzma Kappa came in second. That oh, I guess the jocks really are the best ones. Yeah, that's a so, little disturbing. Uh, huh? Except well, that kind of makes sense because these jocks. It's like as you said, the, the scarers are the athletes, so they've only chosen the peak scarers, the best ones. Of course, they're going to be the scariest. It's like saying the, the football. Oh. Why, what do you mean the nerds couldn't beat the football fraternity in football? Yeah. Uh. Well, but th- the thing is, is that until the final scare game game thing, the, the, the tie-breaking one, we actually don't see anybody from Roar or Mega Roar or whatever it yeah. is or what, do anything. The, all they do is wear jackets and act cool. Like, we never see them prove that they're great at anything mm. there's a football game of which they're not really a part which that is a psych that is actually really funny because you see the two football teams are like oh no what are we gonna do and of course one of the monsters is like three stories tall <laughs> yeah. and it's got its hand out like he's trying to block anything <laughs> which is all two stories below him and he's just going down the field <laughs> making a touchdown because yep. what are you gonna do um, but we don't see the Roar Omega Wars do anything. No, but that's, so. that often is the case with these like entitled rich boy frats. These guys, and, and let's face it, that that's it's how they're portrayed. They're there because you know they're, a lot of them are probably legacies. But let's but also consider they're pretty scary looking. If you looked at the guys from Uzma yeah. Kappa versus the guy who's a humanoid well. crab or the guy with the the <laughs> horns or Don is not Don is scary. not scary. He's got a bat bat wing for a mustache, squishy, which is just <laughs> squishy. Isn't scary, although he, I do like they play up the creepy his creepy ability to just suddenly be standing behind you. Yeah, that was yeah, and they use that. I, but also, you, you, the, the weird thing for me is that the Uzma Kappa guys before Mike shows up and makes them his team because he needs to have a team or he can't enter the scare games to further the plot or whatever. Um, I don't get the impression that any of them were thinking of being in the scared uh, group. Like, I don't know that that was a thing. I can't remember. They, he asks them about that, and I think they all... No, it's not they were. They all washed out. Right, but none of them seems particularly passionate about it. Like, none no. of them seems disturbed like the, by the fact that they're not in there. Anymore. No. Oh, well, you know, gee, that didn't work out, so we're going to make doors, eh? And <laughs> I think they're going to be fine with that. Like, I could easily... Now... Fine, they find their inner scare and they're able to move on, and that's great. But it, you'd, you'd think that there would be at least a scene of them all moping, saying, "Oh gosh, I wish we could have gotten into that scare thing, or we didn't get thrown out." But there isn't. Mm. So he kind of it feels like he makes them do something that they weren't even looking to do. But whatever. There's a lot of that in this film. Like, here's a thing, but it doesn't make sense. Yeah, because no, we're just Mike never realizes or or really comes up with. He uses Uzma Kappa. He just says, yes. I need some people, you're going to do exactly what I say, and it's not because I want to help everybody or I want us to succeed as a group, it's for me. And you guys, no. are, you guys are all here to, to help me. But we at least get that move, move, moment in the film where friendship and teamwork is magic. Oh, yes, God, you can just <laughs> see a, that coming a mile away. Like, oh, yeah, look. Yeah, it's, hmm? it's about ten minutes after the training montage because yes, we needed that. yes. <laughs> Which, 
I mean, again, they took something that uh, they took a very brief sequence from the first movie, which was like when they get up in the morning and Mike is running Sully through basically calisthenics. Right. I like, like scary feet, scary feet, scary feet. Parents duck. <laughs> okay, yeah. twins in a bunk bed. <laughs> Yeah, that's, and it's that, that's cute. That is it's cute because it only goes on for about thirty seconds, and they stretch this out again and again and again. It's like okay, yeah. seven-year-old girls afraid of lightning and lions, like, <laughs> which is great for Sully because he has that roar. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, hey, I want to get something real quick because I've been trying to get to this for the last oh six episodes. Yeah. Uh, Easter eggs. Ah, uh, yes. How do we feel about Easter eggs? Well, you tell me. You first. I, if it's something that's just done for the animators, like the classroom being A113, I don't get it. I didn't go there. No one's going to notice it. I don't care. But working in, like, it's become a thing to work in characters from the next upcoming Pixar film. This film, it's not so bad, because I don't think anything... I didn't notice any Easter eggs. Mm. I was I was purposefully... It's like, I know you want me to look over there in the background. I'm not looking. <laughs> um I don't want to see the damn pizza truck. Apparently it was outside a frat house, which yeah. that's fine. That's where it belongs. If it's stuff where it's not going to get in the way, where I'm not going to notice it, I don't care. But dead Remy? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I don't need to be thrown out of the narrative. And I don't... I, I kind of... I almost want to say just don't do them. Because they don't add anything to the viewer's experience. They're only there for people who like to sit there and freeze from guess what i noticed i noticed this thing that nobody else noticed it oh except these other thousand people on the internet boo <laughs> or animators or something mm -hmm. it's like i i i kind of wish they wouldn't do them uh, I, I don't know it, for me it depends how intrusive like you say how intrusive they are dead remy was very intrusive <laughs> I don't mind stuff in the background. I don't mind like, oh, hey, if you look back there, you see the beast, or you see somebody from a Disney movie, or there's, you know, Mickey Mouse's head. If I it's just, subtle, because if it doesn't, as long as it doesn't interfere with the flow, then fine, knock yourself out. We don't care. We don't notice. But then why is he, why are you doing it? Eh. Oh, it amuses me. Okay, but there's a chance that it would knock. So I just, I don't see the point. Yeah. I don't get it. It's one thing to do um, one or two, but with Pixar, they just flood them. They have so many. Yeah. And then they're now because people know they're there. Yeah. It's a thing. And I'm sure, I whatever. But it's like knowing that the pizza, like, I didn't see it. I don't want to see it. But knowing that the pizza truck was in Brave, it's like, really? Yeah. <sighs> whatever. Um, the other question I wanted to throw up <laughs> <laughs> is, so oh, we talk a lot about Pixar films, the best ones being challenging. And I think it's fairly safe to say that we don't find this film very challenging. No. Nope. Um, although the other one wasn't challenging and we were fine with that. Yeah. But why isn't Pixar so challenging anymore? Why aren't movies in general... I, I don't find so many movies challenging, although occasionally you'll get that Christopher Nolan film that makes people go, what is this about? <laughs> but it's a rare film. Because remember, we just did that series called Ancient History of the 90s, yeah. right? And I think both you and I were surprised at how auteur-ish yeah. and interesting and quite honestly challenging some of those films were Fargo. Mm -hmm. Like, wait, that made how much money? Yeah. <laughs> Best picture? Yeah. Um, why do you think, or if you, you put, maybe we already have a reason, but why do you think we don't see films like that so much? I don't anymore? know. That's a, that's a very Pixar. big question. I, I can only guess, and one of them is because I think part of it is the consolidation of media. You have a very small number of enormous corporations who put out most of the films. And the corporations, who is it? Michael Eisner had some quote saying, we are under no obligation to create art. If we can mm. create, you know, our, their obligation is to, is to make money. That's what they right. want. So everything gets heavily focused grouped. They try to figure out what will appeal to the largest audience, the lowest common denominator, what, and they don't think people want to be challenged. And for, to be fair, I know people who said, I've had friends who said, no, I don't go to the movies to be challenged. Real life is challenging enough. I go to the movies to forget. I go to the movies for something fun. And I think the, a lot of people are, uh, feel that way. It's, it's legitimate. But I think what this has, take, has done is it's homogenized a lot of movies. I, I think to the ones that make a lot of money or at least the corporations are convinced that their charts tell them right. that uh, 
this is what will make the most money. And it's the safe, formulaic. That's why we see so many remakes and reboots, because they think, oh, people want what's familiar. And No, we don't. <laughs> yeah, except it's awfully hard to argue with that when Frozen, Frozen 2 makes uh, is now the most successful animated film in history. You promised me you wouldn't mention that movie. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I had to. It was. This is bigger than both of us. Uh, what about what about you? What do you think? What happened? Well, I, th- I definitely agree with your points. You know, I definitely uh, believe that that's a lot of what's going on. I think that sadly, what they've done is they've said the market can only bear giant mega blockbusters. There's no room for anything else, and there aren't studios that are willing to say, "Hey." Let's make $50 million on a movie. Let's make $20 million on a movie. We made profit. That's good, right? Let's just do that. They're like, no, we have to make half a billion or nothing. And because of that, like you said, you can't take chances. It's not going to happen. Uh, and when they do take a slight chance here and there, and believe it or not, I actually think Guardians of the Galaxy was a chance because when I saw a preview for that, both you and I looked at each other and was like, why are they doing a movie about characters nobody has ever heard yeah, of? Yeah, that was a risk. And it was, in a way, although it was also a superhero film, so it kind of wasn't. But what did they learn from that? It's like, we can make superhero movies with groups of them. Okay, and that's nice. And I enjoy them. Most of the Marvel movies I like, but there's nothing challenging about any of them. There's nothing really new or different. The way they the take on the characters might be different, mm-hmm. but it's just a big blow em up action film. They're well done blow em up action films, but you know, I sit there and it's like, you know, where are the Coen brothers of the two thousands? You know, where is, oh, I don't know, who other, what other makers do we have? Where's the the, the early career uh, Francis Ford Coppola's, you know? Not the ones that are making whatever he's making now, which is just whatever. Yeah, where's, so- like, where's Sophia? Although she, a lot, the thing is, a lot of these well, people... she's on Apple TV+. Yeah, <laughs> you see, there is one of the answers. I think a lot more experimental yeah. stuff is being done on the streaming services. Yeah. And, th- and I get it. Mm-hmm. I, I like to go and be, and to forget, too. But occasionally, I just want to go see something that's really good. So a film last year, because we did this in our special for the Oscars, Mm -hmm. that I did not want to see. Was not interested in seeing, but it was one of the top-rated films, and I tried to get as many as we could before we couldn't go see movies anymore. Mm. And Which I ended up loving was 1917. Oh, yeah. I really, I really, and I'm really glad I got to see that in a theater, because it would not have had the same impact at home. No, it had to be on a big screen. And that's a that is a somewhat challenging film, not because it's telling us anything new, but no. the way it's told. Which, admittedly, it's not the first film to do that. The uh, the one camera perspective, a single continuous it, shot that was unique. Yeah, well, apparently that's been done before too, oh. but not I think in as big a well known film. But it, that film gripped me, and I was interested, and I wanted to know. I'm not a war film guy, but it was something that because it got noticed and people were talking about it, it's like, I want to see something that is not just a Disney film. And again, Disney films can be challenging, just not very often. So I, I think there's room for that, at, but it's just like now they're all decided, no, there isn't. We, we can't take a chance on just making $20 million in a movie. You know, there has to be, we have to make more. And it's so rare when somebody is given, here, have a million bucks, and they make a film. And it actually does, like, it comes out of nowhere and makes a whole chunk of film. See, Films that lead to careers like Pi. Did you ever see Pi? I did. It was a very strange movie. But it was interesting. It I think was. That, is that Darren Aronofsky? I think it is. Um, who yeah. went on to make, again, mostly art films, but, you know, some pretty amazing, challenging film. And the, we just don't yeah. see it. The real difficulty to me, it, it isn't, and this, you know, is not, not exactly what I said before, but... It's not just that a smaller group of large corporations are making movies. There are a number of small studios, and nowadays, with the, te- the technology has gotten better, it's not as hard for just somebody to scrape together fifty thousand dollars and make a movie. Hmm. It's uh, it's the que- hmm. the thing is a very small group of people distribute the movies. Yeah. So you right. a lot of people are probably making really interesting, challenging movies, and we ain't seeing them because mm. maybe they show in four theaters in Dubuque or right. someplace, but they're not being distributed because, again, that's not just the studios, it's the theater chains. It's like we want butts in the seats, and we want uh, the largest number of butts in the seats. And the part that's really weird to me 
is the film that comes directly after this chronologically, and I mean chronologically and when it was released, Yeah, is the most challenging film Pixar ever made, That's... and it made more money than this did. Yeah, that was Inside Out, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, which we talked about, was it last week? Last yeah. week, yeah. And what's the lesson learned? Oh, we should make more sequels. Well, to be fair, actually, they're... they're that had after that, they didn't make as many sequels, yeah. but... And we don't know about Soul, because that's not due out till Christmas Day, which looks like it might be challenging, because it's talking about death. Um, but I... <laughs> lessons. Yes. Right. Speaking of lessons, we're getting towards the end. What other points yep. did you have do you want to bring up before we get to the, the big surprise? <laughs> uh, again, I just... It still surprises me that some of the message of this film is just is wanting and working isn't always enough. And sometimes you really have to examine what your dream is and see if it's really something that fits you. Because you can have a dream that that turns out is not quite right for you. Could even be destructive for you. And remember, when you're at your saddest... Booze makes everything better. Yes. That's that is this is a message from the Booze Council. B W O Z E Booze. <laughs> well, if that's uh yeah. it's another one of our sponsors <laughs> right, a- right after Rogue Warfare 3, yep, yep, Booze. Booze. Uh if we're both uh, ready, it could yep. be that time. I think it is. The roundup. So Max. Yeah. What are your overall feelings? <laughs> Please shock our audience with yeah. your deviant behavior. It's, uh, again, Pixar doesn't do a lot of genuinely bad movies, and I don't think this is bad. I just no. don't think it's up to their standard. Again, visually, it's terrific. All the character design, a lot of it is really fun. I like the sorority of uh, hell be- hell demons with the glowing ro- who go from like cheerleaders to blazing red eyed monsters. Yeah. I, I, I like the visuals. Uh, some of the sight gags are okay. The animation's spectacular. But, this again, this is like Cars 1, where I'm going, we've seen this before, and I expect better from a Pixar movie. Mm. This was okay. If someone else had done it, I might have gone, this is pretty good, but this is Pixar, and sorry, guys, you set the bar high. We expect you to come near it if not clear it, and this didn't even get close. What about you? How would you feel about it? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that bar thing, because I found an interesting quote from Leonard Maltin when he reviewed this film. Uh, He gave this film four out of five stars, wishing it had been funnier and less plot-heavy, and he said, this is his quote, Pixar has raised the bar for animated features so high that when they turn out a film that's merely good instead of great, they have only themselves to blame for causing critics to damn them with faint praise. End quote. I think that's fair. I I dim too. And I, you know, in some ways I have to sit there and go, well, we're asking a lot. We're asking them to create a gem every time. And I don't hate this movie. Hmm. Um, I even, there's even parts of this film I like. I don't disagree with most of all, again, the message of you can't do some things, kids, so give up. (laughs) It's just weird. Um, I don't think it's give up. I think it's, you know, redirect. It's well, but they they don't emphasize that part. No, they don't. Again, we're, we're going off to the gray Haven. So yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Stop (laughs) comparing this to Lord of the Rings. (laughs) (laughs) But there's so much alike. Um, I, I, it's. I think kids like it fine. Like you said, it's bright, it's colorful, it's well designed, it's well animated. The textures we're really starting to do are weird. Pixar are starting to do some amazing things with textures. Um, I just don't think they serve as a particularly interesting story. I'm not surprised by anything here, like ever. Um, it's just it's fine. Again, if the to be fair, if we look at their sorry, I'm not French. <laughs> If we look at their herb and we say, wow, the worst they have to show is this, that's not really so bad. No, that's, yeah. (laughs) But I just wish more. And when I see things like Inside Out that are tackling such amazingly complex ideas, I want to see more of that. And are funny. I mean, there's so much laugh out loud stuff in in Inside Out. (laughs) That's true. I laughed. I did laugh out loud. And not all of it was Louis Black. A lot of it was. (laughs) But, and, you know, the fact that you've got people like Steve Buscemi doing a cartoon voice. But the jokes in here feel yeah. very slapstick and yeah. very, again, 50s, 60s, we've seen it before. Um, and so it's like, I, you know, maybe kids thought it was funny, and that's fine. But these films, 
weren't originally anyway just for kids they were for everybody yeah and I, you know i start to feel a little but i feel included because it's like oh i know where you're getting your reference material but i feel discluded because uh you're, this isn't funny yeah so so well speaking of other pixar movies what pixar movie we were going to see next week frozen 2 <laughs> that's not pixar oh uh so i'll have to change that huh yes you will ah well, I think we're going to watch their uh, their French film, uh, which Are a lot we? of people... Uh, yeah, their French film. Uh, we're going to watch La Oncle Aube. Uh, no, we're going to watch The Incredibles. Ah. Why? Because I like it. That's why. Oh, I gave it away. Uh, <laughs> well, so we're yes, going to the... find our super suits and uh, be back here next week. Uh, we're going to watch The Incredibles, which, to be fair, did the same thing this film did. <clears throat> Which was it engendered a sequel that we didn't know we didn't want. But yeah, we're not we'll talk about we'll that get film. to that later. <laughs> we're not going to talk about how all the voice actors sound that much older, but not. Anyway. Yeah. Next week, <laughs> The Incredible. Incredibly. So, mm-hmm. For now, I would just like to say Bomb Voyage. Bomb Voyage. We I did that thing. This has been a co-production of The Voice of Max and The Movie Wrench.